Yeah, so there's no way I can get into it, huh? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, I know. I just, I'm just two days late. That's just the way it goes, yeah. All right, yeah, I thought the deadline was today. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks anyway. Yeah, talk to you later. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey. Yeah, it was a class that I was trying to get into at uh, one of the universities, and, well, I missed the deadline. See, I really thought the deadline was today, but really it was two days ago. But the fact that I was real sincere that the deadline was today should have counted for something, shouldn't it? Well, obviously, no, it did. The deadline is the deadline. Rules are rules. And in this first lesson in the series, All Roads Lead to Heaven and Other Popular Fiction, we're looking at the idea of sincerity. Because so many times when it comes to God and heaven and that sort of thing, we just look at sincerity. Oh, Grandma was real sincere in her beliefs. Yeah, I know you're real sincere in your religious beliefs. And, but really, when we get right down to it, sincerity uh, is important. But it's not the sole determining factor in what is right. What The sole determining factor is going to be the Bible, the Word of God. And today, we're going to look at a passage out of Acts chapter, we're going to start in Acts chapter 18 and go on into chapter 19 with uh, Ananias, uh, or rather um, Aquila and Priscilla, helping out Apollos. And then going to chapter 19, where Paul meets the 12 disciples of John the Baptist and has a discussion with them about their baptism and what it means. So get your Bibles. Open up to Acts chapter 18, verse 23, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hit the subscribe bar when the notification bell pops up. Click on it. You'll be notified anytime I add content to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. And remember, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. And I appreciate you taking that challenge to read that out of the King James. There's a passage in there. I just like the way that uh, one of the verses there is worded, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. But that's one of the rare times I uh, ask for a specific version for the reading. But we're just glad everybody is here. And this morning, I want to look at this idea, and I think we need that turned down just a little bit back there. I want to look at this idea about sincerity. If I'm sincere about something, does it necessarily mean that I am correct? I mean, how many of us have been in a position where we really believe something to be true, but it turned out that we were wrong? Uh, several years ago, I was visiting a cousin down in Florida, and I had made arrangements. I had a couple of days, made arrangements just to go to the beach and do some touristy things. His wife dropped me off at the beach that morning with our carpooling group, and then I went and did the beach and saw some museums and things, and I gave her a call. I was catching a plane that night to go back to Anchorage, and I called her, told her I was ready, and she said, all right, I'll be at that parking lot where I dropped you off. So I waited, waited. She didn't show up. And, you know, it got to be about 4 o'clock, I think was the time we had agreed to, and it was after four, got to be five, and still she's not there. And then I finally saw my cousin's car. He had a little sports car coming in, and he was a little bit miffed uh, because he said his wife had been looking all over for me. Well, it turned out I was at the wrong parking lot. That beach had several parking lots, and they all looked alike. They all had a changing uh, place for the men and the women, and I think they had a snack bar. And I didn't even, I was about 14 at the time, I didn't even think to look to see if they were numbered or named or somehow designated with letters or anything. So ended up missing my flight and had to fly out the next day. Now, keep in mind, I really thought I was, I was right. I'd have sworn on a stack of holy books of your choice that I was at the right meeting place. But I was wrong. Now, did my sincerity make do anything to help me be right? Well, obviously not. I was sincere, but I was wrong. 
Now, somehow when it comes to our religious beliefs, we like to equate sincerity with being correct. And somehow that because someone is really sincere in their religious beliefs, it's acceptable to God. I mean, doesn't just being sincere count for anything? Well, yeah. And I've conducted a lot of funerals over the years and attended probably for every funeral that I've attended uh, or that I've preached, I've attended at least one more. And a lot of times it comes up how sincere grandma was or grandpa or whoever. And that's good. The thing is, our sincerity really doesn't have a whole lot to do with our standing before God. It is good to be sincere in our beliefs, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. Now, I did a funeral for a man years ago in his early 70s, very, it was the largest funeral I've ever preached, and he was in his early 70s, he literally dropped dead from a heart attack in his living room. And after the funeral, I was at uh, the, the luncheon afterwards, and I heard his wife talking to some friends, and they got on the subject of salvation and baptism and that sort of thing, and she said, yes, he was baptized as a teenager, at his mother's insistence, because they went to a, uh, predominant large denominational church, and his mother very active in the church, and she really pushed it on him, and he felt like it was forced on him as a teenager. So what do you think he did when he got to be an adult? He wasn't there anymore. He didn't go. In fact, I remember him in the, from the time we got to town till the time he passed away, I only remember him coming to church twice. Once where his granddaughter, two of his grandkids were baptized, and then once for a family reunion so they could get on the road, they had about a 45 minute or an hour drive, and that was it. Now, he was a nice guy, all right? By all accounts, and what I knew of him, really nice guy, uh, the kind of guy, if he was uh, at the local restaurant and then saw a family eating and it looked like they were on hard times, he'd very quietly go over and just get the check and pay it. But is he saved? And he was immersed, and everybody seemed to think, okay, that's good, that's all we need. Is he saved? Well, I have a very deep theological answer for that. You ready? I don't know. I don't know what his eternal destiny was. But I had someone come to me not too long ago with tears in her eyes discussing her family who she knew died without the Lord. All of us are probably in that boat. I know I am. And I said to her, well, my typical response when someone asks me about that is, look, we can't do anything for grandma or grandpa or whoever. But let's talk about you. Let's talk about me. Let's talk about those of us that are still here and our destiny with the Lord. So I want to do this series. And I'm going to tell you some of this is going to challenge you to think. And that's what I want. I want everybody to think. Remember, to be a Christian, you got to think. And I call this series All Roads Lead to Heaven and Other Popular Fiction. These are some ideas that we'll find, and some of us have had them from time to time. These are ideas that a lot of churches teach, a lot of people believe, but biblically, they're not correct. And I want to look at the idea today of sincerity. Does sincerity equal correctness with God? Does it mean because I'm sincere in my beliefs, I'm right with God? And I'm going to submit to you the answer to that is no. Just being sincere is not good enough to pass muster when we stand before God in judgment. And I want to share this, uh, this was from about four or five years ago from a Facebook thread. And I want you, if you can see the, what's highlighted in yellow. There are seven billion people on this planet and seven billion paths. There is no one path that is better or more righteous than the others. Our heart guides the path right for each of us if we quietly listen and don't allow religion to get in the way. Now, by our heart guides the path, I'm assuming they're meaning something about our conscience, and I'm going to talk about the conscience, I think, in, in two or three weeks, and whether or not that is a safe guide. And my kind of wise guy answer to that question is yes, no, and maybe. So there's a teaser for you. you got to come back. I think it's uh, two weeks from now I'm doing that one. And then there was this one. Uh, that print's a little small, but a visitor visited us during the church service with two different baptismal certificates. He asked, uh, I have been baptized in the Pentecost church and the Methodist church. Why should I be baptized again to be added to the Lord's church? And a comment was, if one is baptized in a denomination, how could it be scriptural they know about the Lord's church? Now, there's Pentecost and Met there's going to be two different teachings there, plus what the Bible says. So we got to go through this. And again, we have to think it through. And I want us to look at 
the passage that uh, Mike read a minute ago, and we're going to see these people who were sincere. Starting here in Ephesus, the capital of the Roman uh, province of Asia Minor, it's modern Turkey. And it was a pretty major city then. This is where the Temple of Diana was, or Artemis, depending on your translation. This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it's not just any small town. This is where the riot happened after Paul preached the gospel. A bunch of people uh, became Christians. They were saved, and then they started destroying all their assorted idols that added up to what, what the Bible calls 50,000 pieces of silver. I don't know how much that is today. It depends on the price of silver. Uh, and then, you know, however you adjust for those kinds of things. But I, I want us to think about this today and this idea of being sincere. And I call this, unto what then were you baptized? And hey, I was sincere, so I must be right, right? So let's, let's have a look at this, this idea. And see, in matters of faith, like other matters of life, sincerity is not enough just being sincere. I can sincerely right now believe, and it could be, I could tell you it's my truth that I'm lying on a beach in the Bahamas enjoying some iced tea and the sunshine and the surf. Anybody want to think that that's a realistic proposition right now? Well, looking out the door, I can tell you right now, you'd probably think I had lost my mind what little bit of it I have left. Because reality and facts and truth really don't care what our feelings are. So let's look at this idea. Paulus, a very eloquent man, it says, came from Alexandria, arguably the second most important uh, city in the Roman Empire. Named for Alexander the Great, that huge library there, and all the available learning that he had, all the knowledge that he had there. Uh, seemed, you know, he's eloquent in the scriptures. Uh, and now he's here in Ephesus. He is a powerful and an eloquent speaker. He can hold his audience's attention. Probably, I'm going to guess, could get up and talk without needing any notes. I can't do that. I wish I could. I always need something to prompt me. But it says, look at verse 25, if, you're in, uh, if you have your Bible open. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in spirit, spoke taught, and taught accurately the, way of the, uh, the things of the Lord, but knew only the baptism of John. So he had a thorough knowledge. Remember, the scriptures at this point is just the Old Testament. New Testament hasn't been written yet. He is familiar with the, uh, with the baptism of John, so his knowledge is incomplete about the gospel, about what has been going on now since the baptism of John. And it could just be a simple matter of geography. He's not, you know, he's up there in Ephesus. He was in Alexandria. He just didn't get around to Jerusalem. Don't know. There, there's, some, there's some gaps in the knowledge of what we know about him and about the 12 we're going to look at here in just a second. But he is eloquent. He is bold. He is a powerful speaker. And uh, then along comes Ananias and Sapphira, uh, or, or uh, Aquila and Priscilla. I get my characters mixed up sometimes. And they hear, listen to what he's, he's speaking. And they realize he needs a little bit of help. He, he's uh, he's uh, doing good. He is sincere in all of this. But he is still incorrect. He is still wrong. And I want to notice a couple of points here. And he, had dedic he had talent. He dedicated his talent to the Lord to teach, to preach, to proclaim it. He was bold. He wasn't backing down. He wasn't watering anything down. He, he told it like it was. And then he was not too proud to admit that he was wrong, that he was in error. Now, if you've come out of a religious tradition, uh, denominational or otherwise, you've had to somewhere along the way do this. Admit, okay, what I believed or what I was taught was wrong. Um, I had to do that. I didn't grow up in a church going home. I didn't uh, grow up uh, in the Lord's church, and that's, you know, some of you know that story, and it's another story for another time. And then he continued to grow. Probably the biggest mistake we make is when we become a Christian, we sometimes stop studying. But Christianity is like anything else in life. You got to continue uh, reading. When I was a legal assistant, lawyers had what we called CLE, continuing legal education. They had to do so many hours every year. Uh, in insurance, uh, in edu if you're a teacher, you've probably got continuing professional development. They call it different things. But as a Christian, our professional development, our continuing education goes on for life. We continue to study. We need to continue to learn. And Apollos uh, did that. Now, as, as he went along, we don't know exactly what his deficiency or his lack of knowledge was. We just know that uh, he was missing something 
somewhere. But I want us to notice too what or how Priscilla and Aquila uh, conducted themselves. How did they handle this when they came across this guy who obviously sincere, obviously knowledgeable, but eh, a little bit off on some things? A couple of things we can see. First of all, they had enough knowledge to recognize the error when they heard it. Now, I, I hear this sometimes, well, I don't know a whole lot, or, or, you know, I'm not a preacher, I've never been to Bible school. That's okay. Are you, are you a Christian? If you are, you know enough to spot at least some error. You, you've been baptized, you know the plan of salvation, you know enough to be able to spot some error, at least. And then they, uh, they did uh, not believe that the error, uh, that just being sincere, was good enough. In other words, they didn't say, okay, Apollos, we understand you're very sincere. Just go on with what you're doing. They, they came along and recognized it, took him aside, and they also believed the best of Apollos. In other words, they gave him the benefit of the doubt. They didn't just hear him and say, oh, this guy's a heretic. We need to get on our social media, get billboards up. We need to be calling him out and denouncing him in front of everybody and embarrassing him and that sort of thing. They believed he, the benefit of the doubt. He's sincere. He is really trying. So let's help him out. Let's be positive about this. Another thing is uh, they went to him personally. They didn't go around to other people there at Ephesus and say, did you hear what this guy said? I can't believe somebody actually said that. Why is he even up there preaching? Why are they even letting him speak? They went to him, just like Matthew 18 says. You got a problem with a Christian, with a brother or sister, you go to them first. You don't go running to social media. You don't go running to the, you know, uh, whoever you go out to eat with. You don't go running to elders or deacons. Go to them first. That's what they did. And then they did not embarrass them. They handled it privately. Don't know how they did it. They might have said, hey, why don't you come over to the house and let's, uh, let's have some coffee and let's talk about this. Or come over here and, in in, you know, step into my office. Let's talk about this. But it was something they tried to do quietly. And then they were kind and gentle in their approach as to how they, they uh, corrected him. And he seemed to take it. He took it uh, in stride. We don't see him getting mad or going out in a huff or anything like that. We see him uh, taking what instruction, what help they offered him. And I have no doubt it had to do with the way that they approached it, too, as much as his own uh, mindset, that he was open to being taught, that he was open to hearing the truth. See, they, they, there's a great deal of what he taught was accurate. That's where they started. And then instead of attacking him, they started with what he already possessed, the truth he already possessed. One of the people that was instrumental in my spiritual growth when I became a Christian came out of a background of a, of a particular church. And I remember him saying that the people of that church where he came from, they don't believe the Bible. And I thought about it, and that bothered me. And I thought about it over the years, and I thought, no, they believe the Bible. They are just off on a few things. And most of our, you know, Protestant fundamental denominations, if we had a list of 10 things, found out what we believe and what they believe, I'm going to guess probably on seven or eight of those things, we agree. There's two or three, though, that are going to be key things that we part company on. So we can start with the common ground and move from there and, and you know, let them talk, we talk, and that sort of thing. Uh, and be, and be uh, open to uh, uh, listening to whatever, especially if we want people to listen to us. we got to be ready to... Uh, listen to them. So they got Apollos on track and taught him more perfectly so he could go out and proclaim the truth. And now here comes Paul. Paul meets the 12. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to them, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, unto what then were ye baptized? Okay, so he's, we don't know how the conversation started, but it did. And something was said, and Paul, and, and Paul thinks, oh, wait a minute. I don't think these guys are disciples. I don't think they've, they've been converted on, uh, by the authority of Christ. So they were baptized into John's baptism. And he said, well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, remember that phrase, baptized in the name of. And then he laid hands on them, and they received the, the Holy Spirit. Did you receive? 
Paul starts a conversation with them, assuming they're disciples, assuming that they've had what we would call Christian New Testament baptism. And the term disciples here does reflect that idea, that he's thinking that they, they, they've been properly uh, taught. And there's, again, something struck Paul that wasn't quite right. Their knowledge, once again, like Apollos, is incomplete. They know the baptism of John. They don't know the baptism, apparently, of Jesus is what it looks like. So their knowledge here right now is, at this point, incomplete. So the response is, intended it looks like, to say they didn't know the Holy Spirit's outpouring had come. They didn't know uh, that it had come out on, on, uh, on Pentecost. It's been quite a while now at this point since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And remember, they don't have the communications that we do then. So apparently they're, they're just not up on it. Now, some have taken it to mean they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, period. They'd never heard of it. So it's you know one, uh, one or the other. But then notice he said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, on Christ. John was uh, pointing towards Jesus. Okay, so John's baptism was good, but it's been superseded. There's a new baptism for, for, uh, uh, now by the authority of Jesus. It's been, so John came and did his ministry pointing to Jesus. Remember, here's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. And so now we, that we're not baptizing in the, or by John's authority anymore, or by his teaching. And this is the one instance in the Bible where we see a, a rebaptism, where people are baptized again. So Paul's going to explain. Here's John's ministry. He had a purpose. He is pointing people to Jesus. He is preparing the way for Jesus. And remember, John said, I'm not even worthy to reach down and undo his sandals. That was a task reserved, remember, for the lowest servant in the household to wash the feet and undo the sandals and that kind of thing. So John says, I'm, I'm below the lowest servant in the house when it comes to Jesus. And so we don't know, again, what prompted Paul to ask this question. We don't know specifically what the, they believe, other than they knew the baptism of John. You know, beyond that, we're not really sure. We don't really know how they learned it. They could have been there when John was preaching and just brought it back to Ephesus with them. But Paul is explaining to them the proactive character of John's baptism, the proactive nature that he has got things ready. And now that Jesus is on the scene, it's time for John to fade into them. In fact, John said, I must decrease that he can increase. I've got to get out of the way so that the one coming after me, being Jesus, uh, gets the spotlight, gets the center stage. And then brings us to this question. Like a movie line says, you got to ask yourself a question. Unto what then were you baptized? Can we conclude that if one's baptism lacks an essential element, that it's necessary to do it again? Hold that thought. We're going to come back to it. Look at some of these elements that go with baptism. Now remember, those 12 men and Apollos, very sincere. They were bold. They knew what they believed. They could give you an answer why they believed it. But it wasn't quite right. They were a little bit off track. Here's some essential elements we got to think about baptism. If you look up baptism in Webster's Dictionary, or any English dictionary, it'll say it's pouring, sprinkling, or immersion. The word actually means to immerse, to dip, to plunge. Look up Romans 6. Uh, it is a burial. Now just think, when we have a funeral, how do we bury somebody? Have you ever been to the cemetery and seen a coffin or a body laying on the ground with a cup of dirt poured on it? No, we dig a hole, we put them in it, we cover them up. Another one you might want to keep in mind is Luke chapter 16, verse 24, the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man says to Father Abraham, have mercy on me, send Lazarus, that he may dip his finger uh, in water and cool my tongue, you want to take a wild guess what that word for, for dip is. It's a form of the word baptize. He's saying, go to him, let him baptize his finger and drip the water on my tongue. How do you dip your finger? If I give you a glass of water, how are you going dip to dip it in? And I say, you know, or you're at, at a restaurant, the Mexican restaurant, and you're dipping your chips in salsa. What are you going to do with it? Sprinkle it on or scoop it out? So keep that in mind. Second, the proper authority. By whose authority are you baptized? I had a friend who told me once she was baptized five times. 
I said, that's one shy of the, the record that I know of, which was six times a friend was done. And I said, why so many times? She said, well, I've changed churches a time or two for various reasons, and every time I do, they want me to be baptized to join the church. Well, the, the, to join the church is not really the right reason. Acts chapter 2 says, you, verse 47 says, we are added to the church by the Lord. The Lord added daily those who were being saved. So from a biblical standpoint, you can't join the church. You're added to the church. Then there's our purpose. Why, why were you baptized? Was it to join a church? Was it because, well, mom and dad have been kind of pushing me at it? Was it because, well, you know, I've been dating this girl or this guy and church is real important to them, so I'm going to get, be baptized just so that, you know, that we can take our relationship to another level? Or is it to have your sins forgiven? And then are you the proper subject? Are you a penitent believer? In other words, are you turning from sin? towards, towards uh, the Lord, towards Jesus. Well, I haven't really done anything that bad. Well, maybe that's true, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe, maybe you haven't committed murder or any felonies, but just stop and think. You know, most of, you know, most of us probably have told little white lies once in a while. Most of us probably have taken things from the office that we shouldn't have. But that's nothing big deal. Hey, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You still have a sin on your record. Those essential elements. And when one or more of these elements is lacking, then a rebaptism is, is appropriate. And in this case, the proper authority, Acts 19, the proper authority for baptism was lacking. They were not yet baptized in the name of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus. And we still do that today sometimes. Uh, anybody here still write checks? I know most of us probably don't do it anymore, but if you were to write me a check, then by your authority, the bank's going to pay me so much money, whatever it says on the check, by your authority, in your name. Anybody ever use power of attorney? If I give you power of attorney uh, to uh, make medical decisions or to uh, uh, transact a business for me, in my name, you have my authority to act on, uh, in this particular situation. And so, by the authority of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that's why we are baptized. And then, uh, from there, look at a couple of other things to kind of tie up some of the loose ends. If uh, one's baptism was improperly administered, pouring or sprinkling, or if it's a non-biblical purpose, it should be repeated to make sure it's correct and for the correct purpose. This usually comes up with young people, and I don't know why this is, but it's before the age of 13. If, if people are baptized much before then, for some reason, the rates of them being rebaptized go up. I don't know why. It just, just is. After the age of 13, it, it drops off. But here's the thing. Understanding what you're doing, and that's usually what it is. I was just too young. Uh, I was at camp, and the cool kids were being baptized or parental pressure, whatever. That's why typically I have people write it down. Why are, are you being baptized? Write today's date down, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they'll write it down. They'll hand it to me. Does this look good? I'll say, I don't know. It's up to you. You write it down, make copies of it, put it in your purse, put it in your wallet, put it under your pillow, keep a copy of it so you'll know why. If you ever have any doubts, you can look back and see what you did and why you did it. Uh, when one has been scripturally baptized, there's not a need to do it again. You know, if you were taught properly, you understood, and it was the right uh, authority or everything was right, you don't have to worry about it again. But, just, you know, time, memories fade and things uh, happen, so that's why I have people write it down uh, for your own benefit down the road. And then once we have clothed ourselves with Christ, in baptism, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us of our sins as we repent. We're still going to sin occasionally, but we still confess it. We repent of it. We change, you know, try to do better next time, we might say. But that's, that's where it comes in. That's when we can have the little talk with Jesus and get forgiven, after we've been immersed to have our sins forgiven. But here's the caveat. You know, beware. 
1 John chapter 1, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, watch this, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice the condition. I have to continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. I can't just get baptized today and then say, okay, that's good enough. And uh, like, like has happened a time or two where, oh, well, I'd never really intended to start going to church. Well, then why did you get baptized? It would have been better that you never heard the word of God than to hear it and then fall away. It's a continual thing. If I want to walk from here uh, down here to, uh, to Ella's and have lunch, I got to keep walking until I get there. I can't just take one step and stop. I have to keep going. So when our lives are lived in God's light, two things. Number one, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means we have to make changes in our lives. That means we've got to go in a different direction. That means we've got to make a lifetime commitment. You know, just like with marriage, we make lifetime commitments. This is a lifetime commitment as well. Now, understand this. It does not mean moral perfection equal to God, okay? We're going to, like I said, we're going to sin, going to make mistakes. We're going to do things wrong. But as long as we get to pick ourselves up, you know, think of it this way. Uh, if you're, you're walking and you fall in, in a mud puddle, you get up, dust yourselves off, clean yourself up, and you go on. That's the person who, you know, falls into sin occasionally. It's different than someone running out and jumping in the mud, you know, rolling in it and getting themselves all muddy and staying there. That's the person that leaves the faith. Now, we get told by a lot of denominations that you can't lose your salvation. I'm here to tell you that, uh, unfortunately, that's not true. We do can lose our salvation if, if we're not careful. That's Notice, he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. If we stay in the light as he is in the light, we will have the fellowship. If, that's conditional. But getting back to our original question, can we conclude if one's baptism lacks some element? Is rebaptism necessary? The answer is yes. And that's up to you. You, get, you. Only you know why you were baptized. I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer it. So should I be rebaptized? Should I be rebaptized uh, into Christ and not just count on my sincerity? I know I, I don't doubt the sincerity of anybody who uh, uh, is here today. I don't doubt very many people's sincerity when it comes to their relationship with God, but sincerity is only going to get you so far, and it's not going to be very far. So even though Quil or, uh, Apollos and the Twelve there were sincere, even though they, they were, they were uh, sure-footed on their beliefs, they were good people by any human standard, they still had some areas that they were off. So before we get too far off and, and think, oh, just be sincere, and then sincerity is good, and, and that sort of thing, ask yourself these questions. Was I baptized with the right mode? Was I baptized with the right authority? Was I baptized for the right purpose, the remission and the forgiveness of my sins? And was I the right subject? Was I a penitent believer? This also lets out infant and, and uh, uh, toddler baptism because they can't repent of sins. They, you know, a newborn uh, doesn't have any sin. But later on, it's as we grow and as we start to get that rebellious nature, that's where we get into trouble. So these are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And lacking any of these, I would strongly consider that a person make their calling an election sure and make sure that your uh, baptism, your walk with the Lord is right. Not just count on sincerity, but what does the Bible tell us? So this morning, we'll stand in a minute and sing. Only you can answer the question if you're, if you're uh, uh, walking uh, in the light as he is in light. Only you can answer the question about uh, those four points. If there's any doubt in your mind, let's talk about it before you leave. Let's make sure that you are right. If the Lord were to come back right now, are you ready to go home and be with him? If you're not, we need to talk. And if you are, that's great.
So we'll stand and sing. Give that some thought and do what you need to do to make sure you're right with the Lord. And if we can help you and you'd like to respond, then do so while we stand and while we sing. Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other path I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus.